back to the Niemer Hour. As always, I am your host, Ramsey Niemer. Uh, in this segment, my illustrious panel and I will be talking about a very divisive and controversial issue, which is that of Afghanistan. Um, currently, in this political season, there's a lot of uh, pressure on the current administration to enact his promised withdrawal uh, about U.S.-led NATO forces in Afghanistan. Uh, proponents of this support it by sta stating that the, uh, the military's nation, nation, nation's objectives have been completed. Uh, Af yeah, Afghanistan has pretty much been uh, eliminated. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sort of tripping on all this. I retract. Um, Al Qaeda has pretty much been eliminated all their training grounds in Afghanistan. The Taliban has largely been isolated uh, and isolated in the northeastern Pakistan province. Uh, culminating with the death of Osama bin Laden, uh, the proponents of this ideology state that our mission's objectives, or our nation's objectives, have uh, been accomplished. However, our role has changed and evolved depending on the situation on the ground. Instead of killing insurgents and drone attacks, instead we're distributing food, and our State Department is fostering a fledgling democracy. Ironically, this mirrors a lot of the Soviet efforts during their occupation of Afghanistan. They sought to politicize and secularized the cities that they occupied. Um, their emphasis was women. Um, with the newly established American-backed government, great strides were made in the area of women and their efforts for self-autonomy. Uh, this is in uh, stark contrast to the Islamic fundamentalist ideology of women as property. Uh, effectively, women have no rights, um, and man is primary, with women being secondary. Here with us today to aid us in this challenge is Dr. Samuel Overcash. Uh, Dr. Overcash is a contributing editor to the Heritage Foundation and holds a doctorate in foreign relations. Thanks for being here, Sam. Great. Um, Sam, can you tell us about the struggle uh, in Afghanistan against fundamentalism? Well, once again, thanks for having me on, Mr. Neer. Um, Afghanistan has basically stagnated. Uh, we thought of in terms of progressivism and technology. Uh, the American people have come to know such terms and understand them, uh, <coughs> Sharia law and what that entails for women. And uh, the Taliban has been very instrumental in, uh, in uh, the adherence of these customs and traditions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <coughs> you know, throughout the ages, basically. So it's been going on for a very long time. You know, it's just been terrible throughout history. Uh, however, before the U.S. occupation of this land, there were efforts made to, to moderate and to modernize Afghanistan. Um, going back to the early 1900s, the then monarchy actually sought to modernize and emulate European culture. Well, Sam, uh, excuse me, Doctor, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, that was then. I, I apologize. Let's talk about today. Let's talk about today's Afghanistan. All right. Well, today the treatments and rights of women, you know, they're still terrible. They've stayed consistently terrible throughout the ages. Um, women have very few rights and are given little to no leeway been found to be in violation of certain laws and customary practices. Uh, actually, two months ago, the Ulam Council in Afghanistan issued a document that stated that men are fundamental and women are secondary, which echoes the Taliban's beliefs you know, and ideas of women. Uh, this declaration actually continues to allow men to, to have the right to use physical force against women in the case of Sharia complaints. And many, many people expected the way of democracy and freedom to sweep the nation uh, when the war on terror was set in motion, but so far that hasn't been the case. Uh, the Taliban still exist in great numbers, and they're still carrying out suicide uh, suicide attacks to this day. Well, let me let me cut in there just to to get to the crux of the matter. What is what is your take on the, the U.S. withdrawal? Well, at some point you, you kind of have to know when you cut your losses, you know. And I think we we've, we've done pretty much all that we can over there. You know, we we fought the good fight. We've tried to help them, you know, modernize and, and get a, a stable political system in place that I think it's about time to, to pull out and just you know, cut off. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, moving to the, the horrible issue and condition of women in Afghanistan, we have with us uh, an experienced photojournalist, uh, Charlie Baki. Uh, she's recently here, uh, returned from Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm glad that you're back here safe and sound. Uh, secondly, I'd like to get um, your, your take on what's going on in Afghanistan. Okay, well, thank you for having me on the show. Um, under the Taliban regime, women are not allowed to work outside of the home. They are not allowed to have a formal education. 
They must be escorted by a male relative inside the <coughs> home, and they also must be clad in a burqa at all times when they're outside the home. Burqas are long robes that cover the body from head to toe. They are extremely hot for the wearer and cause a bad odor inside. These women can feel claustrophobic um, due to the dust from the streets being kicked up. It sticks to the cloth and makes it very hard for them to bleed. These women are also at greater risk for asthma. As you can see in this photo, the women, um, their vision is quite impaired. It said you were wearing horse blinders, which can only see very limited, and um, it's difficult for them to see where they're going. Well, Charlene, uh, since the fall of the Taliban regime, uh, how have women fared with uh, the NATO occupation? That question, unfortunately, has a double-sided answer. In the first 10 years after the Taliban was ousted, two and a half million girls had enrolled in school. Women are back in the workforce as doctors, lawyers, judges, and police officers. In fact, this year, Afghanistan is sending its first female boxer to the Summer Olympic Games. Her name is Sadiq Rahimi, and she has a picture. However, one out of 11 women died during pregnancy and during delivery of children. Still, over 80% of women are illiterate, and only 6% of women over the age of 25 have received a formal education. By the age of 18, only 18% of girls are still in school, compared to 42% of boys. And women work for 25 cents less per dollar than their male counterparts. And only 20% are actually in control of their own money, so they have a husband that's still holding on to their money. Um, and still 87% and more of Afghan women um, have experienced gender-based violence or the victims of gender-based violence. Charlene, I don't mean to cut you off. We're against a hard break. Uh, we've got a Twix commercial coming up in about two minutes. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, our guest uh, here actually from Afghanistan um, to give us a more first-hand account of the ongoing fight against fundamentalism. We have with us Hashima Abu. Uh, Ms. Abu, I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Uh, Ms. Abu is a representative of the Young Women for Change. Uh, Ms. Abu, could could you tell me who the figurehead, who's the figurehead uh, for this movement for women's rights in Afghanistan? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. The person you are acknowledging is none other than Afghan Zong Bazi Kuzi. She was elected the first woman in parliament in 2005. She was a former med student, but because of the Taliban, she was kicked out of school and forced to drop out. Ironically, after being kicked out by the Taliban, she focused most of her time on women's rights organizations such as our own. And her commitment to these organizations fueled her ambition to help women in Afghanistan obtain their rights back. As she um, approaches her campaign against Hamid Karzai, who has served as two consecutive terms, she's more threatened with her family and her everything. So <clears throat> our organization focuses mainly on women's rights, but we also discuss diverse topics such as the U.S. troops leaving Afghanistan. Oh. Ms. Abu, speaking of that, what's the consensus uh, with the women that you've talked to about the, the pending withdrawal? Women want the U.S. troops to leave because we want peace, but not at the cost of our freedom. Because if the U.S. leave, then the Taliban will be more involved and we'll be right back where we started. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all my guests. Uh, in closing, um, I'd like to address this movement and Ms. Kufi personally. Uh, Ms. Kufi, the Nehmer News Hour staff and, my, and myself uh, would like to express our deepest respect regarding your fight for women's rights amidst the threat of violence against you and your family. I'm sure many in our audience are supportive of you and we wish you Godspeed. Thank you. In closing, uh, to further illustrate the plight of these women, uh, we have a very brief video for, and we ask that you watch it instead of turning the channel. Um, as always, we wish you a good night and we'll see you tomorrow.
So we got 